Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. Life in Accounting is the podcast for everyday heroes like you working in the accounting profession. Are you ready to hear from accounting influencers, thought leaders, visionaries, and other professionals leading change in the accounting world? Then stay tuned for Mark Goldman, a CPA, the owner of Where Accountants Go, and your host. Welcome to Life in Accounting. I require myself and all of my staff to be certified as concealed carry experts because, quite frankly, we run into some pretty rough characters. Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Goldman, a CPA and your host for Life in Accounting, a podcast production of whereaccountantsgo.com. That clip was from Steve Dawson, a forensic accounting expert who happens to be in the Lubbock, Texas area. Frequently, I start the interviews thinking that we're going to go in one direction. And then as we get deeper into the conversation, there is much more to the story than I possibly imagined from my initial research. And Steve's career journey definitely fits that description. I learned much much more about forensic accounting than I had realized prior to recording this episode. If you're interested in forensics yourself or possibly interested in where accounting intersects with law enforcement and even CSI type work, this episode is going to be for you. This one really is something special. As long as I'm on the topic of something special, by the way, I'm super excited to announce that my first book just got released. The title is 49 Tips for a Successful Accounting Career, and it's a collection of some of the best advice I've heard over the many podcasts we've recorded so far, along with some insights from my own accounting employment career, of course. You can find it on Amazon, and we'll have it posted on the whereaccountantsgo.com website as well shortly, probably by the time you're hearing this episode. Once again, that title is 49 Tips for a Successful Accounting Career. If you decide to check it out, I'd love to hear any feedback you have for me. I can be contacted at markg at whereaccountantsgo.com. Let's go ahead and get into the main content for this episode. Here's forensic expert Steve Dawson. Well, hello, Steve. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Mark. It's great to be with you. Wonderful. Well, for our audience, we have Steve Dawson in Lubbock, Texas on the line today. I was doing some research on potential guests for the show, and I came across Steve and and figured he would be a good individual to invite. For many years now, Steve has had a specialty in the forensic accounting area, and although we've done a couple episodes on forensics, it's been a really long time, and so I figured it was about time to get a refresher, so to speak, on that particular specialty. Plus, each and every guest, you know, has their own unique insights for us on the program. So I'm really looking forward to this. Steve, before we get into your current situation there at Dawson Forensic Group, I always like to start at the beginning so the audience gets the full story. What initially led you to decide to pursue accounting as a possible career choice in the first place? Well, Mark, when I got ready to go to college, I was not originally an accounting major. I went into college as a math communications major, and it was about a half a semester into my college career that I realized that wasn't what I wanted to do. And so not having really any idea of the direction that I wanted to go, I changed my major to general business. And one of the very first classes that I was able to take was an accounting class, and it was introductory to introductory type accounting class. And literally the first day that I was in that class, I fell in love with accounting. And so to speak, the passion came alive. And at that point, I knew I wanted to major in accounting. Interesting. I love that. An introductory to introductory accounting. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. That's definitely the basics. (laughs) Yes, I wasn't. Obviously, I wasn't far enough along in my prerequisite to begin the true accounting classes, the principles of accounting and so forth. And so This was somewhat of an introduction to the introduction, and it just, like I say, the passion came alive, and I knew that's what I wanted to do. Okay. I just have to ask, because I'm curious, do you think it had something to do with the professor, or was it just really the material that seemed to resonate with you? It was the material. Okay. 
In fact, I can say, I, if the professor remembers me, I apologize, but I don't even remember who that professor was at that point in time. Just the subject matter was exactly where I thought I needed to be. Okay, wonderful. Well, that's been a few years, so no one holds that against you. <laughs> one or two, yeah. <laughs> Just curious. So did you you know, pretty much proceed straight through college at that point as an accounting major, or were there still some decisions to be made, or how did that work? I proceeded straight through because of that semester that I spent in mass communications. I finished my four-year bachelor's of science and accounting in four and a half years. And so it, it didn't delay me too much, but I went through uh, focused on the accounting major at that point in time. Perfect. Okay. Well, what was your first either, I guess, internship or part-time work experience in the field? Or what was your first job out of college? How did you get your start? The last semester that I was in college, and that's at Texas Tech University here in Lubbock, there was a local accounting firm that was advertising for paid internship in the audit department. And so my last semester in college, I went to work for that public accounting firm. That was Bollinger, Seegers, Gilbert, and Moss on the audit staff. And as soon as that semester ended, upon graduation, they asked me if I would stay on full time on the audit staff as an entry-level junior auditor. So that was my first exposure to public accounting. I loved it. They seemed to like me, so I knew, at least for the time being, I was in the right spot. Wow. Okay. And I know from the pre-show research, you stayed there 25 years? 26 years. (laughs) I guess that was the right place. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it turned out to be the right place. it really, it worked well from day one, and I loved it. And I also must mention that I married a Lubbock girl my last semester in college as well. And she was born and raised in Lubbock, Texas, and did not want to leave. And I was very happy with Lubbock, Texas. And so all of that fit together and gave me a place to be and a place where I could thrive and progress. There you go. Well, it's hard to cover... You know, 26 years in 30 plus minutes on a podcast. So what were some of the highlights of that time and of your career with them? And I know there's probably several, but also at what point did you start to ease into the forensic area specifically? Well, you know, looking at the highlights, the uh, several to mention as I, as I began on the audit staff, the firm specialized in several different industries about seven really unique different industries. Two of those were financial institutions and not-for-profit organizations. And it just so happened that those two industries were really ripe with fraud. Obviously, financial institutions always have been, and I dare say always will be, full of the opportunities for fraud to occur. And then the not-for-profit organizations, you know, even 34 years ago, there was plenty of fraud occurring in those. And so as I was doing my normal annual financial statement audits, there would be times that I would run across, trip over, so to speak, the issue of fraud. And so that really introduced me through on-the-job training, for lack of any better term, what forensic investigation was, what fraud was, and how prevalent it actually was. So really through that time, through the years then, I became the forensic investigation person at our firm, but I still had to do my regular audits as well. And so through that time, you know, really my progression involved moving up to senior level staff, manager level staff, and then I became a full partner at nine years. And then at 15 years, I became part of the managing partner team. And so it just kept going on an upward track. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I'm curious. So forensic accounting and forensics is something we've been hearing more and more, or maybe it's just me. I've heard more and more about in, you know, the last few years. Did you even call it forensics back in the early days of your career? I mean, was that what the firm even referred to it as in the late 80s and early 90s that when you were getting started? That's a fantastic question, actually. Uh, the Really, it was, it was fraud. Okay. You know, if I was going to do what I would call a forensic investigation today, 
that was really referred to as a fraud investigation. And even my governing body, the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, it stands for fraud examiners, not forensic examiners. That was really, you know, founded earlier than my career. And so it was referred to as fraud and forensics really kind of became the pretty word, so to speak, later on. Okay. Going back to some of the highlights of my time at Bollinger Seegers Gilbert and Moss, you know, the obvious professional highlights were passing the CPA exam, thus becoming a certified public accountant, uh, becoming a CFE, a certified fraud examiner. I began really through my progression at BSGM, ending up on the speaking circuit and doing a lot of conference speaking and keynote addresses. And that seemed to work really well. I absolutely love standing in front of a crowd and talking about hopefully what I know. And then obviously other big cases that I worked, all of those are highlights through my career there. The biggest highlight I would say that existed over that 26 year period is that was a period of forming contacts and relationships. And these contacts, these relationships, as those were being formed, I really had no idea how they would benefit me in the future at that time. Interesting. This is a little bit of a chicken or the egg question, but we we have a lot of younger professionals, up-and-coming professionals and students that listen to this. Do you feel like the speaking engagements came as a function of you, you know, being promoted and, and the position you were in? Or do you feel like the promotions and the later positions that you were offered, you know, within the firm came as a result of you being willing or saying yes to the speaking engagements? Or, I'm not even sure if that's a fair question, but I'm, I'm curious. Do you feel like one led to the other in any way? That is a very fair question. And I believe that the progression, the advancement, came as the result of the ability to communicate. Okay. In the audit function, as I would go to, you know, the standard annual financial statement audits, once you're done with those audits, each year you go to the board of directors and you present the audit report. And I feel like that I communicated well. Didn't provide more information that would, quote, bore people. I provided the information in a succinct manner. Uh, clearly communicated. And so I think that recognition of the ability to communicate led to the speaking engagements. And then the rest just kind of took off from there. Okay. Well, tell us about how Dawson Forensic Group started. I mean, what led to that transition and what were those early days like? The start of the Dawson Forensic Group, really, before it was formally established, that idea had been in existence for a long time. As I had progressed through my time at BSGM, I became, again, the forensic auditing person, the forensic investigation person, and that was my passion. I loved that. You know, when we talk about loving accounting, I loved the puzzle part of what forensic investigation represented. And so I did more and more of that, along with the full load that I had to handle as far as my annual financial statement audit responsibilities. And then again, as I mentioned previously, I had the additional responsibilities of being on the firm management team. Well, it was it was about five years prior to the establishment of the Dawson Forensic Group that regulations really became clearer and clearer in that a financial statement auditor really cannot perform forensic investigations for audit clients, because basically what you're doing at that point in time is taking an advocacy position for your client, and in doing so, that impairs your independence, which is a requirement to perform financial statement audits. So the ability to do both forensic auditing and normal financial statement auditing basically disappeared. My desire was in forensics to do forensics full-time, And so after 26 years, as hard as it was, because uh, BSGM was my family and still is, after 26 years, I had to take early retirement and step out there and hope for the best, basically, because that's really what that is doing after 26 years, starting your own company. So you just love the forensic side so much that you decided to 
to jump in. I did. And I, <laughs> absolutely. And I felt, you know, I felt like the demand was there through the years. Each year there was more and more fraud issues showing up. I felt like the demand was there to keep me busy. And in fact, you know, uh, talking a little bit about the early days of the Dawson Forensic Group, you know, I wanted, after my early retirement from BSGM, I wanted about two weeks to get everything together and kind of advertise a little bit about what I was doing. And, you know, these years later, I'm still waiting for that two weeks. It just hasn't happened. And so, you know, again, branching out on the early days, there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of lack of sleep. You know, the I was coming from a normal audit practice in a public accounting firm and had done that for 26 years. Well, in a normal audit practice, I know I have this client base. They need an audit every year. It's basically going to be done around the same time. And so I know my schedule for tomorrow all the way into the next however many years I'm going to be alive. And in the white collar crime world, in the forensic investigation world, that's not the way that works. You know, white collar criminals do not steal according to a regular schedule. (laughs) (laughs) The excitement is not knowing what waits on the other end of the phone of each phone call. The anxiety is not knowing when that phone call is going to come. And so I still had two of my four kids in college at that time. And so there were were quite a few sleepless nights. Are there any stories you can share about, you know, any of the cases you've worked on that we may find interesting? Obviously, without, you know, details, has enough time passed on any of them? Oh, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of time has passed on many of them. You know, the stories that just come to mind overall in general, the goal that people have to do the things that they do, the creativity that they have to do the things that they do is amazing. Yet at the same time, it surprises me constantly how little thought they put into it. Let me give you an example of one of my stories that I think illustrates that perfectly. We had an individual that was responsible. Her position at her company was the responsibility for planning the conferences that the organization put on. And so her job was to correspond and communicate with the hotels and say, you know, we need a meeting room for, let's say, 200 people. And she would receive a quote from the hotel and says, okay, that'll be $8,000. And she would get a faxed quote from the hotel, take it to her employer, tell her employer, I paid for this with my personal credit card and I need to be reimbursed. And so the company would reimburse her $8,000, yet she never really had paid for that, especially with her own personal credit card. So we go on down the line now, and the meeting actually took place, but there was really only, you know, 50 to 100. And so the meeting really only cost $4,000. As a result of that, she paid that bill with her personal credit card. (sighs) But she'd already been reimbursed by her company for 8000 So on that one transaction, she would make as much as $4,000. Now, we look at how she was able to do this or how many times she was able to do this. Basically, because of the volume of meetings that her company was having, she could do this up to three times a week. Oh, so that's pretty good take. You know, that's $12,000 if we just use this as an example. Yet. Let's see how she got caught. Basically, you know, when you go to lunch and you charge the lunch on your credit card or debit card, they bring you two documents. One is the merchant copy and one is the customer copy. And so on the merchant copy, she might tip the server $5 and then pay for that on her personal credit card. Then she would take that customer copy to her employer and say, I need to be reimbursed for this business lunch that I charged to my personal card. But she might put on that copy that she tipped the server $6. So in that respect, from that one transaction, she was able to gain $1. And that person that was able to get $12,000 in a week also had to have that extra $1. 
And that's how she got caught, was somebody noticing an issue. Actually, the person turned in a receipt to a Barnes & Noble for a book purchase uh-huh. and had just written in a tip amount on a book purchase because she was trying to get all of her documentation in and didn't notice that it really wasn't a meal. <laughs> it was the purchase of a book. <laughs> So things like that continue to amaze me to this day that they can be so brilliant and yet not brilliant at the same time. Wow. Greed and carelessness, basically. Oh, my God. Absolutely. And of late, you know, the last several years, we have a lot of activity with drug cartels, organized crime, the mafia. And, you know, I spend a lot of time at a table with these characters, these perpetrators attempting to get confessions or attempting to get one organized crime member or cartel member to turn on the other. And those can get quite interesting. And I've pulled people off of my senior investigator. And, you know, it's it's amazing what you run into out there. There's a lot of things as far as your protection is concerned that they don't teach you in accounting class. I had no idea. Coming into this, I figured we would talk about some theft case, you know, somebody stealing money from their employer, which, I mean, that's bad enough, of course. But I I didn't realize you would be using terms like mafia (laughs) on this episode. Wow. Okay. You do a whole lot more than I realized. It's absolutely amazing. You know, I often use the term or the statement that it's not your grandmother stealing from the cash drawer anymore. We're dealing with some real dangerous characters. And my education and upbringing, you know, really dealt with the types that I would classify as grandmom stealing from the cash drawer. Yet now it seems to be progressing to the point of danger. I require myself and all of my staff to be certified as concealed carry experts because, quite frankly, we run into some pretty rough characters. Wow. Okay. Hmm. I have not had this kind of conversation with a CPA, at least recently, but not that I remember, actually. <laughs> wow. And we've had a couple of retired FBI on the show. So this is interesting. Interesting. Wow. It really is. And I've had some cases where uh, one in particular, again, I won't give any specifics of it, but I constantly talk with people that are involved in the fraud, trying to get as much information as possible. And there was one case where I interviewed an individual that wasn't directly the primary perpetrator, but was an individual that knew and assisted somewhat, an accomplice, let's just call him that. And I spoke with him and got a lot of information. And about a month later, he ends up dead. Then about two weeks after that, another person associated with this that we had spoken with ended up dead as well. And so you get to a point where you don't really want to advertise that a whole lot or nobody's going to want to talk to you. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's amazing what really is going on out there. And I know that accounting can't prepare you for that. And I never dreamed of it, you know, 35 years ago, but you have to adapt. So you're not being strictly contracted by other accounting firms to do this work then. Are you being contracted by law enforcement as well? Or how are you yes. getting on? Okay. Yes, we are contracted for forensic investigation with, you know, the companies will call us and say, we think something is going on. Basically, we have to establish predication or probable cause to do a forensic investigation. You know, there has to be some type of smoking gun. We cannot be hired by anybody that says, hey, everything's going great. We don't think we have any fraud problems. We just want you to do a forensic investigation and uh, let us know if you find anything. We can't do that. That's not legal. We have to have predication or probable cause to investigate something. Then as we get in there and investigate that something, if we run across different areas, we can go to the full extent on that as well. So we will have companies that say, call and say, hey, we have some suspicions. Here's what this is based on. Here's some documentation that kind of points to that. And so we'll do the investigation. We also get those same calls from law enforcement, from governmental agencies. We can get a call from FDIC, NCUA, the National Credit Union Administration, the FBI, Secret Service, 
Securities and Exchange Commission here in Texas, the Texas Rangers, which is state law enforcement, and local district attorneys and local police departments. So we do we do a lot of investigation for law enforcement authorities. Wow. And one of the things I wanted to ask you, we could keep going for hours on stories, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I was curious, doing this as long as you have, you know, for 30 years, back before we even called it forensics, what changes have you seen in either the type of work or how it's done? I mean, what changes have you seen in the forensic area, so to speak? I would say that that is a two-part change. Okay. The first major change that I have seen over 34 years would be a change in the perpetrator's you know, like I said previously, it does not appear to be grandma stealing from the cash drawer anymore. It's now these dangerous players. But the reasons for and the motivations for a lot of the fraud that we encounter is really what has changed. Hmm. In the sense of greed, it really was years ago was one of the primary motivating factors for committing fraud. And right now, I would say in 95% of the cases that we investigate, it's really need rather than greed. And I attribute that to, yes, I attribute that to several things. You know, the, the financial needs, the financial pressure that exists in today's society is so different than what it was even 30 years ago. You know, years ago, credit card minimums changed where they had to be you know, higher credit card minimum payments. And I think revolving debt or credit card debt really became at an all-time high over the last 30 years. And so that introduces immediately a financial need. And so people aren't stealing necessarily for greed purposes any longer. They get into the desire to steal for need purposes. And that is one of the primary changes that I've seen is the financial incentives. I also, just as a soapbox type scenario, so to speak, I believe that student loan debt really over the last decade has contributed to this need. We have students graduating now from college with massive amount of debts, and there are questions as to whether they can overcome that. And so almost immediately, you get into your first job, and almost immediately, there's a fantastic financial incentive or pressure on individuals to potentially look at stealing. And so one of the biggest changes kind of in summary there is in the perpetrators. I think obviously the second change of the two-part change is really in the tools, the investigative tools. You know, we literally went from 14-column paper, green bar paper, and a number two pencil to today, high-level digital and data forensic analysis tool. When my senior investigators analyze a hard drive, I can walk in there and He's got that hard drive all hooked up to everything in the world. Looks like he's launching the space shuttle with everything that he's using to do the data analysis and the data forensics. So the tools have changed substantially. Okay. You know, it's intriguing about the debt because I think many of us have heard the story of, you know, the individual that realizes there's a hole in the system or a way to manipulate the system. And so they steal some money however they do that, and they don't get caught. And so then they right. do a little more and they don't get caught. And then they start to get a taste for some of the finer things. And you know they go buy a more expensive car, a more expensive house and a boat and all this kind of stuff. And, and, right. and then they take on more and more as they go. I hadn't thought about it so much from having the debt in the first place and the hopelessness feeling that you're describing. That's intriguing. And you kind of, uh, you allude to, you know, really what's going on in people's minds. The fraud triangle is one of the best illustrations. And the triangle is really obviously a three-point triangle that gives indications of factors that exist in a situation when fraud is discovered more often than not. And the first point of that fraud triangle is the incentive or pressure. What is that incentive? What is that financial pressure? All of us go through times in our lives where we experience a financial need. Sometimes it's medical, unexpected. Sometimes it's student debt or revolving debt. Sometimes it is of our own doing, such as getting to a point of living beyond our means. 
And so we have that first point of the triangle, which is that incentive or that pressure. And then you put in the second point of the triangle, which is rationalization. And rationalization basically translates to the ability that every one of us has to convince ourselves that what we're doing is not wrong. And the most common rationalization that I run into is I was just borrowing the money. I was going to pay it back once I got past this financial crisis. And so now we've got an individual that is under an immense amount of pressure that can convince themselves that what they are doing is not wrong. And then the third point of the triangle is opportunity, which really translates to weak to no internal controls. And so now we've got that person sitting in that position with weak to no internal controls under an immense amount of pressure that don't see themselves as criminals because they've rationalized that what they're doing is not wrong. Hmm. Wow. So if I'm listening to this podcast and I am, you know, getting ready to graduate from college or maybe I'm in my first, you know, couple of years of my career and I think, wow, this sounds cool. I can make a difference in the world by doing this kind of work. What advice would you have for me or what skills do you think it's important for someone to develop in order to get into this field and to grow in it? I believe that the first skill in forensic investigation of internal fraud is to have an accounting base. And I don't necessarily mean that you need an accounting degree, but I think a knowledge of basic debits and credits understanding financial statements, understanding how accounting works, I think that that is, uh, number one, is an absolute need. And so whatever major you might choose or profession you might choose, that accounting knowledge is very, very helpful. Secondly, I guess I would say that the computer sciences, the digital forensics, the data analysis, nowadays that type of background, that type of understanding of how computers work, how data works, how to analyze that is absolutely necessary. As far as the education is concerned, I believe that there should be a law background as well. Hmm. There is so much that we do in the forensic investigation arena that deals with law. I would say that 70 to 75 percent of issues that we deal with are legal issues, not only investigating legally, But when you get up on the witness stand, you need to know how to conduct yourself. When you go through depositions, you need to know how to conduct yourself. So I believe that that is an absolute necessity in the total toolbox that you have. I also believe that you need to be an absolute expert technical writer. Hmm. We talk about communication. And the ability to communicate, well, that translates to a courtroom, that translates to interviewing witnesses, suspects, and so forth. But the technical writing part of your job is absolutely, to be an expert is a must. Because your product, your testimony file, the testimony file, the documentation that supports what it is that you're writing into your forensic investigation report, not only has to be legal, but it's got to be clear and concise. And that's really the difference between winning and losing in a court of law. And there's not a worse feeling of being on a witness stand, being cross-examined by a defense attorney when you have a weak case or one that has not been communicated properly. And so I feel like technical writing, the way that we write our forensic investigation reports is the icing on the cake. It has to be expert. And then I really also believe that a understanding of psychology, how people think, is absolutely necessary. There are so many times in fraud prevention and fraud investigation that we're dealing with the mind of the perpetrator, and we need to understand the mind of the perpetrator. We need to understand how people behave, behavioral psychology. We need to understand how they think. So I think that is another important aspect to have or tool to have in your toolbox. And then I just believe along with the communication abilities, I believe that public speaking, if you have a fear of public speaking, you need to get over it. So if I were to advise somebody in this area, what should you consider getting into and learning? It's not just the numbers. In fact, it's these other things, accounting, law, computers, writing, psychology, all of that makes a good toolbox. 
you know, the deeper we get into this conversation, I keep having to remind myself that you have a bachelor's degree in accounting and or a CPA. I mean, because I feel like I'm talking to a CSI, you know. <laughs> That's how I feel sometimes. It's unreal. Wow. Well, I want to make sure we're respectful of your time. And the podcast episodes generally run, you know, 35 to 45 minutes, you know, with people's oh, okay. commutes and stuff like that. So I know there's a lot more we can get into. I do want to get to the final question, so because I, I want to make sure we don't leave those out in our remaining time here. I end every podcast with the same three questions. And you've certainly had a very long and successful career from a career perspective. What has been your proudest moment? I would say the release of my book. I had a book published by Wiley Publishing just about three years ago. And basically what I was trying to do with that book was put at that time 30, 31 years worth of experience into designing an anti-fraud program for organizations. I felt like I had a lot to give, and so I submitted the idea and early manuscript to Wiley Publishing, which is one of the, the world's top book publishers, especially of business books. They are famous for the Four Dummies series of books. Oh, yes. And upon submission, it was accepted on first submission. And, you know, that really is a proud moment. Not in a, you know, an overly prideful way, but just to know that the information that I wanted people to know was out there and that people, they could see the value in people learning what it is that I had to tell them. And then, of course, the other proudest moments, there's a lot of them, and that is always really at the point in time that the jury gives the verdict. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, when you hear guilty or when they confess, you know, prior to trial on all counts, that, that's pretty fulfilling. Mm, I bet. Congratulations on the book as well. I, From what I understand, when you submit to a publisher like that, it's rare for it to be accepted the first time. <laughs> Usually there's changes and things. Congratulations. Well, that's, that's that, that was my expectation. So the idea worked. Wow. Well, second question, tell us about a mistake that you made and what you learned from it, of course, that's an important part of it. But frankly, the bigger, the better. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that comes to mind, I accepted an engagement to testify at a sentencing hearing, hmm. a federal sentencing hearing on somebody that had already been convicted. And so, you know, I don't do a lot of defense work. I do some because some people are wrongly accused. But this person had gone through trial, had been convicted, and so now it was time for the sentencing hearing. And uh, I didn't have anything to do with the case or the trial prior to that. So I interviewed the convicted person and, you know, basically became convinced that they were innocent and oh. uh, I was wrong. And one of the things that I pride myself most on is we have to go through a lot of training that I call human lie detection. Mm -hmm. You know, we study the physiology of lying, body language, you know, eye twitches and so forth to determine when people are lying to you. And this person that I interviewed duped me. And my testimony did them absolutely no good and they were given the maximum sentence. That was a horrible feeling. And I guess, I guess the thing that I learned at that point in time from the mistake of believing that I could prove innocence when it really wasn't there and being duped by the person is and never think too much of yourself. Never think you have learned it all, seen it all, done it all, and that you're an expert at anything. You continuously have to work and refine your skills. And that's what I did. I went back and as many classes as I have taught on the physiology of lying and human lie detection, I realized I needed to refresh myself. Wow. Thank you for sharing that because all of us in the different fields we work in, you know, the longer you do it, the more knowledgeable you become. It's easy to start to think that you know everything there is about that topic, you know, after enough years. And it's important to remember that, no, <laughs> you know, we need to keep growing every day. So, right. wow. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Well, last question, and then we will go ahead and close it down. What is the best piece of advice that you have ever received? You know, the best advice that I think I've received, there's a book Richard Carlson wrote called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff and It's All Small Stuff. 
That's a great book, and it is great for the purposes that Carlson had. He wanted people not to be overtaken by the small stuff. But the best advice I received that really applies to the forensic world is really kind of the opposite. If you sweat the small stuff, the big stuff will take care of itself. And I have seen that to be true. And then I also had somebody tell me one time, there's two sides to every story, and the fool acts upon the knowledge of one. And taking that advice, I hope have never forgotten to get both sides of the story in the forensic investigation world. Interesting. That's sort of like if you watch the pennies, the dollars will take care of themselves. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Well, that's perfect advice to end this on. Thank you. This has been a really good interview. Really good interview. Good. Well, for our audience, this has been Life in Accounting, a podcast production of whereaccountantsgo.com. If you haven't yet visited that website, please do so. We're going to have the show notes to Steve's episode here and, of course, every other episode that we've done in the past as well. That website is whereaccountantsgo.com. Also, I have sort of an exciting announcement. I have a book that's being released. It should be on Amazon at the time that this comes out. It's 49 Tips for a Successful Accounting Career. So if you have a minute, please check that out online as well at Amazon.com. On that note, Steve, any final thoughts or words of wisdom you'd like to leave the audience with? Sure. I think on top of everything that we have talked about here as far as the areas that you need to focus on as far as training and having your toolbox, Never, ever underestimate the value of relationships and the contacts that you make. People often ask me, how do you hang out your sign and succeed in your own firm? And that's not done without contacts and relationships. So I would encourage anybody and everybody to look at those as opportunities for future growth, future expansion, and future opportunity. That's a great point. It's definitely always all about people for sure. Well, thank you again to the audience for joining us. We will see everyone next week. There's more to come.